Hello everyone and welcome to Network Playroom. In this video, we'll explore OSPF adjacencies. This topic is covered in the CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure Exam Blueprint, so we'll try to keep the discussion at that level. I can actually show you from the CCIE Exam Blueprint what I'm talking about, which section we'll focus on in this video. So right here under Network Infrastructure, and here OSPF version two and three. So we're gonna stick to this part right here. Okay. I'll also use my CCIE playbook as a guide to demonstrate some concepts and follow along as necessary. I can show you that I have it open in a PDF file here. Right here, you can see my CCIE enterprise infrastructure playbook and this is for OSPF. Um, we we'll, we'll have a lot of information here that we're going to go over shortly. So this can work as some kind of guideline. By the way, I've posted the first part of my CCIE playbook on Twitter and LinkedIn, if you want to download it. That document covers the switched campus section from the CCIE blueprint. The OSPF playbook is not available for public download currently. And this is actually only a part of it as well. All right, so I'm also running an Eve NG lab, which you already saw on the screen. Let me go back to that right here. A very simple topology consisting of four routers. We'll only use two routers, R1 and R2, to begin with. So as I was writing the playbook, I realized how massive just this one topic is. So I might have to split this into multiple videos to keep the content somehow manageable. I want to cover the OSPF states and the adjacency establishment process in general, discuss the requirements for OSPF adjacencies, touch on the database exchange and MTU issue, explain the DR and BDR election, briefly talk about OSPF network types and how that affects OSPF adjacencies, so you can see there is a lot to cover. Now CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure is a lab exam, so technically it would suffice to go over how to configure and troubleshoot OSBF adjacencies, but the whole process is easier if you have a solid understanding of the theory, which is why I want to chew over both. I have done videos about OSPF, like covering OSPF packet types and OSPF LSA types in the past, so you can look for those in my channel if you like. Those videos explain the topics in almost RFC style and show packet captures, so they are purely theoretical. In this video, you'll see live OSPF action on the command line, as we'll be running things on the Eve NG Lab. Okay, let's get started. So let's first talk about the OSPF states. And for that, let me pull up my PDF file, my playbook. And let's scroll down a little bit to find the uh, uh, information about the OSPF neighbors. Now, first and foremost, not every two neighboring routers become adjacent. In certain cases, two routers can be neighbors, but not be fully adjacent. Know that neighborship and adjacency are two different things. It is very important to understand this difference. Two routers are neighbors when they have exchanged hello messages and seen their own router IDs in the received hello packets. In other words, the neighbors are aware of each other's existence. This is called the two-way state. The actual adjacency starts to form in the XStart state when the two routers initiate the database exchange. Once the databases are fully synchronized and the process has completed, the routers are adjacent. This is called the full state. Now both of these states, two-way and full, are stable states, and the other states are transitional. So let's go over the neighbor states in a little more detail as they are listed in section 10.1 in the RFC 2328, which describes OSPF version 2. 
Now, the first OSPF neighbor state is the down state. And if we read directly from the RFC, it says, this is the initial state of a neighbor conversation. It indicates that there has been no recent information received from the neighbor. In other words, nothing is happening yet. Next is the attempt state. And this state is only valid for neighbors attached to NBMA networks. Since this only applies to a specific OSPF network type, which we have not discussed before, we'll just skip over this one for now. Okay, let's scroll down a little bit. Next is the init state. In this state, a hello packet has recently been seen from the neighbor. However, bidirectional communication has not yet been established with the neighbor. In other words, the router itself did not appear in the neighbor's hello packet. All neighbors in this state or higher are listed in the hello packets sent from the associated interface. So this means that the router has received a hello packet from another router, but it hasn't seen its own router ID in the packet. So bi-directional communication is not verified yet. So next we have the two-way state. In this state, communication between the two routers is bidirectional. This has been assured by the operation of the hello protocol. This is the most advanced state short of beginning adjacency establishment. The DR and BDR are selected from the set of neighbors in state two-way or greater. So in other words, the router has seen its own router ID in the hello packet now and bidirectional communication is verified and the routers are in the two-way state, which again is a stable state in certain cases. So after this, the OSPF neighbors go into the X start state. And let's scroll down so we can see the whole description. Like so. This is the first step in creating an adjacency between the two neighboring routers. The goal of this step is to decide which router is the master and to decide upon the initial DD sequence number. Neighbor conversations in this state or greater are called adjacencies. So once the OSPF neighbors go into this state, they are adjacent. This is the beginning of the adjacency. So in this state, the master and slave selection happens and the master is the one controlling the database exchange process. If I'm not mistaken, the master will be the router with the higher router ID. So after the master and slave roles have been assigned, the routers can move to the next state, which is exchange. In this state, the router is describing its entire link state database by sending database description packets to the neighbor. Each database description packet has a DD sequence number and is explicitly acknowledged. Only one database description packet is allowed outstanding at any one time. In this state, link state request packets may also be sent asking for the neighbor's more recent LSAs. All adjacencies in exchange state or greater are used by the flooding procedure. In fact, these adjacencies are fully capable of transmitting and receiving all types of OSPF routing protocol packets. So this is when the OSPF neighbors send the database description packets to each other and describe the contents of their link state database. However, the database description packets do not contain full LSA information. It's more like a table of contents to provide a summary of the link state database. And then the neighbor can send those link state requests in response uh, to ask for more recent LSA information. And this is actually what happens in the loading state. So we'll move on to the next step. So in the loading state, link state request packets are sent to the neighbor asking for more recent LSAs that have been discovered, but not yet received in the exchange state. So this is when the actual LSA information is being exchanged between the neighbors. 
And then finally, the neighbors go into full state. In this state, the neighboring routers are fully adjacent. These adjacencies will now appear in router LSAs and network LSAs. So this is another stable state and the routers are fully adjacent. All right, let's scroll down the playbook a little bit. You can see I have a table here describing the OSBF neighbor states again. This table is from Cisco documentation from the master command list. I actually have it open separately as an image because it got squeezed when I put into the playbook. So we can look at that as well right here. I don't need to read through the text because it's basically the same information we've just covered using sections from the RFC, but I wanted to show it here as a reference. All right, so let's look at the process on the command line. So let's go back to my Eve ng lab right here. So we'll only use two routers, R1 and R2 out of these four routers for the purposes of this demonstration. So let's wake them up. I already have the command lines open here. Let's see, make sure we can access. Enable. There we go. Let's do the same on R2. All right. Actually, before I move forward, let me go back to the playbook. So let's scroll down here so you can see I have a diagram here showing the simple topology that we'll use. So I've only drawn R1 and R2 here because those are the only two routers that we're going to use for now. So you can see the network address and the IP addresses of the interfaces and then the router IDs. So if I scroll down a little bit, you can see the configuration for R1 and R2. So we'll assign router IDs to both routers. So it's going to be easier to identify them and then enable OSPF on the common network or the connected interface. There are actually two ways to enable OSPF, the network command under the OSPF process and the interface configuration command. I can show you both, although my playbook only covers the network command. Actually, yes, let's do it that way because then I can point out some things when we verify the OSPF neighbors. So let's go back to the command line. First on router one, before we configure any OSPF related commands, let's enable debugs on R1 and R2 so we can see the OSPF adjacency establishment process and we can investigate the logs later. So we can do debug IP OSPF adjacency. Like so. And we'll do the same on R2. Okay, then let me go back to R1 for the configuration. So we'll use the network command first. And the configuration is very simple. Everything is done under the routing process. So first let's go to configuration mode. And then we'll do router OSPF one. And then we'll assign the router ID. So router like that, and then we'll enable OSPF on the network. And we'll put them to area zero like that. 
Actually, before I configure OSPF on R2, let's check what information we can find about OSPF right now before any OSPF neighborships or adjacencies have formed. So let me go out of the configuration mode and then we'll do show IP OSPF neighbor. So there's nothing yet. How about show IP OSPF interface? I was hoping we would find the OSPF neighbor state somewhere in these commands, but it doesn't look like it's here. The OSPF neighbor state right now should be down because nothing's happening. We haven't enabled OSPF on the other side. Uh, let me see if there are any other options for the show IP OSPF neighbor command. So let's use the question mark here. How about detail? Nope. What if we use the interface? Yeah, it's not going to show anything. Well, that was just a little thought experiment that didn't work. So let's move on to R2 and configure OSPF on that side as well. So here we'll enable OSPF under the interface. But before we do that, let's go under the OSPF routing process and assign a router ID to R2. So conf t and then router OSPF one and then router ID like so. Now, by the way, the OSPF process ID does not have to match between the routers. I've just used one from muscle memory, basically. Let me get the pen tool so I can better explain what I mean. So I'm referring to this number right here. Now a tip for the CCIE exam, pay extra attention to the instructions when you're doing the lab exam. So you get these values correct. I don't know if this really matters or not. I've heard both. You can lose points for using wrong values or it might not affect your score because the configuration will still work. I would still make sure to use the exact value indicated in the instructions, just to be sure. Better to be safe than sorry. Because it could be the difference between passing or failing the exam, so don't risk it. So what I mean is that the configuration will still work even if I had used, let's say, 100 here instead of process ID number one. All right, let's clear that out and move on. So now that we've configured the router ID, let's go under the interface and actually enable OSPF. So let me exit out of this one and then go under interface gig zero slash zero. And we can do IP OSPF. We can do IP OSPF one. This is the process ID and assign this interface to area zero, like so. Actually, I forgot to do one thing. I forgot to put on the debug. So before I enable this command, let me do that first. So we'll remove this. Debug IP OSPF adjacency. So again, IP OSPF one area zero. Now, as soon as I hit enter, you can see things start happening. So let's wait for the routers to establish full adjacency and let the debug finish before we'll investigate it in more detail.
okay looks like the process is complete so let's look at the debug before we verify the ospf neighbors and discuss other things so let me just um, remove the debugs first so we'll do you all which is for undebug all and we'll do the same on r1 Okay, let me get the pen tool out again and we can look at the debug. So right here on the first line, you can see that we're in init state. So this means that the router has received a hello packet from the neighbor, but it hasn't seen its own router ID yet. Basically, in the next line, bidirectional communication is established because the routers move into the two-way state right here. So now the router has seen its own router ID in the hello packet. Then there is stuff about the DR and BDR election right here. We don't have to discuss that in much detail right now. We can cover that in another video because I don't want to run this for too long. So next the routers prepare for the database exchange. So they move on to the X start state. I don't see that state described here in the debug. Maybe I'm missing something, but here it says we are the slave. So that means R2 is the master. So then right here, you can see the exchange state. And then finally the routers move from loading to full okay that was terrible because i just crossed over the line um let's try that again so yeah right here so you can see how this follows the ospf adjacency establishment process all right let me get rid of this and then let's look at r2 Okay, so here you can see those states again. We have the two-way, X start. Here it's mentioned, by the way, it wasn't in R1, or maybe I missed it, but here it's stated explicitly. We are the master, then you go on to exchange. And again, going from loading to full. And now these routers are fully adjacent. All right, let's get rid of this and move on with the verification. So let me go back to R1. So let's run the most obvious command first, which is the show IP OSPF neighbor, which we used before. Show IP OSPF neighbor, like so. So this command displays a summary of the OSPF neighbors and shows the most relevant information. So let's actually use the pen tool again. So it's going to be easier for me to point things. So starting from the left, the first column indicates the router ID of the neighbor. So this one right here. That's the one we configured on R2. The next column is referring to the OSPF interface priority, which is relevant in the DR slash BDR election. We'll discuss that later. So this one right here, let's say DR slash BDR. We'll come back to that at another time. So the state column shows the neighbor state. Note that this could also be two-way slash brother with network types that elect DR slash BDR or full slash nothing for other network types that don't use DR slash BDR. So it could also be like two-way and uh, whoops, I'm misspelling things. So a druther 
or it could be full and then nothing. We'll look at this later on. So the dead time indicates the remaining time when the neighbor is declared unreachable and the adjacency removed if a new hello message is not received by then. So right here, you can see it's 33 seconds left. It counts down. Uh, by default on broadcast networks, hello messages are sent every 10 seconds by default and the dead time is 40 seconds by default. So technically the dead timer should be reset every 10 seconds when the router receives a new hello packet from the other router. Next, the address column refers to the IP address of the neighbor's interface on this network segment. So this 102 is configured on R2. Now the last column here, the interface column, should refer to the local interface where the neighbor is connected. Now here it's hard to tell because we're using gig ethernet zero slash zero on both routers. As far as I know or remember, there are no fields in OSPF packets that would contain the router's local interface where OSPF is enabled. Therefore, that would not be advertised to the neighbor and the neighbor would not be aware of the interfaces where OSPF is enabled. That sounded complicated, but the point is, why would the local router need to know the remote router's local interface where OSPF is enabled? That's why I believe this is referring to the router's own local interface and not the remote router's interface. Actually, the same argument could be made about the priority value, which we looked at earlier, if it's local or remote, the one right here. But I believe the priority is the neighbor's priority value because this command output should provide information about the neighbor. However, the interface is probably referring to the local interface where the neighbor is connected because again, there is no field in the holo packet or other OSPF packets that contain the neighbor's interface. And that information is not really relevant anyway. Why would R1 need to know what interface R2 is using on the network? All right, let's get rid of this and look at the next command. So we'll use the show IP OSPF neighbor command again, but we'll include the router ID in the command to see if we can get more information there. So let's try it. All right, we have a bit more information here now. All right, let's look at some stuff here. So here again, we can see the router ID and this is the interface address. Same information we saw in the previous command. And this line here actually verifies the theory about the OSPF priority. And I've just completely drawn a line over it. So let me cancel that and maybe just put an arrow pointing to it. Uh, here we see the state is full. And here is more information about the DR and BDR or the interface IP addresses on this network. And here actually you can see some interesting information about the option bits in the OSPF packets. We can look at that a little bit in the OSPF packet capture. I'll show you shortly. And here you can see how long the neighbor has been up. And here's also the dead timer again. Now we don't really have to care about the rest of the information in this output. So let's get rid of this and move on.
actually looking at the command output again, if we focus on this line, it says in the area zero via interface gig zero slash zero. In my view, that is proving that the interface is referring to the local interface. But if I actually wanted to prove it, I could connect the routers using different interfaces, but that would require me to break the entire topology and do this lab again. So I don't really want to do that. So this conclusion will suffice for now and let's move on. Now the final verification command I want to show you is the show IP OSPF interface command. So let's run that. Show IP OSPF interface. All right, let's break this information down. So first here we have the uh, network address and the area ID and pay attention to this line where it says attached via network statement. And you might guess now that we should see some different information on R2, which we'll look at shortly because we enabled OSPF differently, if you remember. And on the next line, we have information like the process ID it's a little tricky to write here. And then it's the local router ID right here. Network type broadcast. We haven't talked about network types yet, so it's enough to know that it's broadcast, but we'll move on. The cost of this link is one. I've drawn kind of over it, but it is one. You can see that the state here is the designated router and our priority is one. And this information is actually pretty cool because you can see both the router ID and the interface address for the designated router and the backup designated router. Because sometimes depending on the output, it's not clear if you're talking about the router ID or the interface ID especially if you let the router automatically choose the router ID. Now we assigned the router IDs explicitly and I actually wanted to do it precisely for this reason. So it would make more sense which one is router ID and which one is the interface IP address. Okay, let's skip over some of the output here and go towards the bottom. So in this section here, you can see how many neighbors this router has on this interface. If there were more routers connected on this network segment and the router had established either a neighborship or an adjacency with them, they would show here. We have four routers in our lab and currently we're using only two, but later on, once we look at other things with OSPF, you'll see that the other routers will show in this output as well. Oh, I just realized that I completely skipped over the OSPF hello and dead times, which are indicated right here. There's also a wait time, which I'm not gonna cover right now, but I'll probably bring it up in another context. All right, let's remove this and go on R2 to look at the same command. So we'll jump on R2. We haven't touched R2 in a while, so it's logged us out. Let's wake it up and then enable. So we'll do show IP OSPF interface. And here is the part that I wanted to show you. Attached via interface enable. So again, if we go back to R1, so it was attached by a network statement, but now we have something different here, like so. Okay, we can run the other two commands on R2 as well, so you can see how it looks different here. So show 
IP OSPF neighbor. So again, you can see the router ID, the priority. Now the state is full and DR. So this is referring to the neighbor state. The neighbor is the DR. So R1 is the DR. And again, the dead time and here is the interface IP address of router one. And again, the local interface. And then if we use the router ID, we can get a little bit more output like that. All right, finally, before we end the video, let's look at a packet capture on Wireshark. So let me open that up. Now this packet capture is from packetlife.net and it's called OSPF Broadcast Adjacencies. I'll leave a link in the description so you can download it as well if you like. So here, if we look at the first hello packet, let's open it up and see what's on here. We don't need to go over all the fields here, but I do want to point out some things. So pay attention to the very first one, especially in the hello packet section and specifically here with the designated router and backup designated router. And soon you should see something else on here as well. So let's look at some of the other packets. If anything changes right here. So this is when the neighbors would go into the two way state. Because now you can see that this router has seen these routers with the router IDs indicated right here, active neighbors. So these routers are attached to the local network. So once a router receives a hello and sees itself on here, sees its own router ID, then bidirectional communication is established and the routers are in the two way state. Oh, and by the way, I pointed out some of the bit information in the command output. So that is referring to this block right here. Let me see. So we had this information, the E bit and L bit. So let's go back here. So you can see they're both on L bit and E bit indicated at, with number one. Okay, let's look at some of the other packets. Let me change this a little bit. So let's see what's on the database description packets. Um, so here you should see information about the LSAs right here. But you can see this is not full LSA information. So again, it's more like a table of contents of the router showing what it has in its database. You can close these. And then let's move on to the LS request packets. So now here the router is requesting full LSA information for the LSAs that were contained in the database description packets, which we looked at just before. Okay, we can close these. And then let's see if we can find some LS updates. Right here, so now you can see in the update packet, the actual LSAs, the full information is advertised right here. Again, I'm not going to cover these fields in detail. I've already done that in my previous videos a long time ago. You can go look for those videos on my channel. So let's cut the video here before we run too long and come back to the other topics in the next videos. We still have so much to cover. I didn't even use my playbook almost at all for this video. 
So we'll probably use that more in upcoming videos. For example, I haven't discussed the OSPF parameters that must match between the neighbors and I haven't described the DR slash BDR election in detail yet. So those are coming next. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.